much for your service. And I know we've had some briefings all across the city. There was one just, I think, last weekend uh, at Palo Alto that I heard was also very well attended. Um, but it's the first opportunity for some of our colleagues to give input. So, um, and then you'll, uh, we know that this is not final. You're still in the draft form, but at least the opportunity uh, to hear from some of us. And um, we appreciate your work. So I'll um, let, uh, Lucas, are you going to be one that's going to get started uh, on the presentation? And um, thank you so much for all you're doing for your commitment to this thank project. You. And all as volunteers, um, I think that's very important to acknowledge because it does take time out of your day jobs. Uh, so thank you for, for what you do. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Lucas Casper Ramirez, and uh, I have the great honor of, of uh, serving as the chair of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you um, to the Comprehensive Plan Committee for the, the invitation to uh, basically, as uh, the Councilwoman uh, shared, to provide uh, an overview and an update on the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force, our process, uh, our preliminary um, policy themes, uh, and quite frankly, uh, this is. Uh, this meeting is really important for all of us because this is an opportunity to hear directly uh, from the Comprehensive Plan Committee that is focused on uh, implementing an essay tomorrow and ensuring that the, the goals um, associated with essay tomorrow uh, are, um, are being carried out. And so in, in many ways, we see the work of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force as uh, building on uh, the great work of uh, the SA Tomorrow Plan uh, and the work that you all do within the committee. Um, as uh, the Council of Women um, shared, uh, I'm joined today by my colleagues on the task force, um, Councilwoman uh, Maria Antonio uh Jim Bailey, uh, Noah Garcia. And missing uh, from the meeting today, uh, he sends his regards, he couldn't join us today, is uh, Jean Dawson. So the five of us have been serving on the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force uh, since summer of uh, 2017, uh, and uh, we're very um, we're very committed to um, this process. As the councilwoman mentioned, uh, for us this has been a very um, we've given a lot of ourselves, um, but we also know that many many people have given a lot of themselves to this process of shaping uh, what the mayor what the mayor calls a comprehensive uh, housing policy that is both comprehensive in terms of addressing the highest policy recommendations, but that is also compassionate, that is also um, understanding and addressing the everyday needs of some of the households and families that often get, uh, get left behind. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started with today's presentation. So SA Tomorrow, as we all know, SA Tomorrow is basically the city's <coughs> comprehensive plan. And it's the foundation that uh, speaks to how the, the city will sustain and manage uh, the, the city's overall uh, growth. Um, you know, building on SA Tomorrow, uh, we all know that uh, there was an effort in 2010 that was launched called SA 2020 uh, that allowed for the community to be involved in this comprehensive process um, to shape the future of San Antonio. Uh, and, you know, I remember at, um, for uh, SA 2020, I was um, working for the San Antonio Housing Authority. And as a planner myself, I was very excited um, with, with the fact that the city was coming together um, to map out its future, to identify a vision, to identify a set of um, goals and, and, um, and and really to identify the highest needs within our city. That SA Tomorrow uh, plan um, is woven into SA, SA Tomorrow, as we all know. Um, and, and so the work of the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force uh, was not about starting from scratch. It was not about creating something new. It was really about understanding all of the efforts that have um, been uh, developed in the past you know, 10 to 15 years, and in some cases in the past 30 years, um, and, and to look at how our city uh, can uh, galvanize around making housing a priority. So what we will be doing through uh, this process and what we have been doing through this process 
is to ensure that our recommendations are aligned to the SA Tomorrow plan, that they build on past efforts, uh, also that uh, we advance a strategic roadmap or a framework uh, identifying the highest ho housing uh, policy priorities. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we've gone, I think, a step further. Uh, we also think it's really important um, that we develop a, an approach to implementation and some key action steps. As a you know urban planner, as a policy person, I you know I love this work, but I also know um, as, a, as a person who has managed um, uh, you know uh, budgets and agencies that that everything really um, relies on the execution of this. How are we going to implement? If we're going to make housing a priority and. and and look at it you know, comprehensively, we also need to have a very sound impl implementation strategy and approach to ensure um, that uh, things get done. Uh, so the Mayor's Housing uh, Policy Task Force will be looking at not only advancing a set of comprehensive policy priorities, but also advancing an implementation plan, a set of uh, specific action steps, and some tools and best practices to guide the work. This uh, graph is not new, um, council members, um, to most of you. This was a graph that was presented just a couple of weeks ago by uh, Peter Zanoni, um, and, and I think subsequently by um, the uh, Director of Neighborhood and uh, Housing Services, uh, Veronica Soto. Um, but this is a graph that <coughs> illustrates one of the key challenges uh, and key problems impacting housing in our city. Housing costs are outpacing incomes. Uh, it is, well, if you look at a, a 20 year, year period, uh, it's very clear from this graph, uh, the top line is uh, the, the housing price index. Uh, in about a 20 year period, the housing costs in our city have increased by about 50%. But then we look at uh, the median household income, and we also see at the bottom line that incomes have not kept pace with uh, the, the rising costs of housing. And so as a result, um, this um, issue is uh, magnified at the neighborhood level, and it's magnified also at the family level. Families are having to spend more and more of their income uh, towards housing, uh, and that's clear from uh, looking at another um, data set, which is uh, uh, important for us in understanding the pressures that families are uh, feeling when it comes to housing. 165,000 uh, households here in San Antonio are experience, experiencing what we call um, cost burdens. What does that mean? That means that uh, about a third of all households in our city are paying more than 30% of their income. And so when we look at housing affordability, and the definition that we are using to define housing affordability, we are looking at housing affordability as uh, housing that uh, allows for families and households to not spend more than 30% of their income. When families are having to spend more than 30% of their income, they are having to choose between paying the rent and paying for food or for transportation or for health care. It begins to put um, pressure on the household. And this is not just a rental problem, this is not just impacting uh, individuals that rent, but it's also impacting homeowners. 21% of all homeowners are uh, paying more than 30% of their income towards uh, housing, and 48% of all renters are impacted by this. So affordable housing for us is um, doing our best to ensure that all households are able to access quality, safe, decent housing without having to spend and sacrifice um, their, you know, their, their, the basic necessities that families need, so without having to spend more than 30% of their income. So now I, I'm going to just walk you through where the task force has been in the last nine months uh, and where we have been with the community uh, in this process of developing uh, the, the key uh, uh, comprehensive um, policy recommendations uh, that will be uh, presented to council uh, next week. 
early on in our process, uh, we thought it was very important as a task force to develop um, a vision statement and a mission statement to guide our work. And this uh, vision statement really has been uh, guiding every step of this process for us. Uh, we have charted really our own process um, as we develop this uh, comprehensive and compassionate housing policy. Our focus has been to be inclusive, uh, to look at providing housing opportunity for all current and future residents, to ensure that um, residents have a meaningful, meaningful say in the decisions that impact where they live, and also, um, you know, this idea that everyone should have a place to call home. If we um, start with that premise, then we're ensuring that we're thinking about every single segment of our city, from the individual that needs housing with services, to the couple who is looking to buy their first home and is uh, in need of um, homeownership counseling and support uh, to navigate through the process. We also uh, were very focused on uh, really using housing as a platform for creating healthy neighborhoods, connected communities, and, um, and, and ultimately a shared prosperity, right? Um, when we look at uh, housing that is safe, affordable, and, and, and stable, uh, we also think it's really important that it be delivered through a sustainable system and this uh, theme of sustainability and developing a system um, that is coordinated really has become uh, a theme that has been um, identified and has been um, a thread, a common thread throughout the entire process. And you, you'll see a little more of this um, in the next few slides. Comprehensive. Um, for us, uh, comprehensive meant that um, it was not enough for the five of us to sit around the room and look at data and come up with policy statements. Uh, we developed what we consider consider uh, a very uh, very much a bottoms up approach, an inclusive approach, an approach that was informed by community, um, uh, an approach and a process that was informed by data, and also um, a process that was informed by understanding how other cities across the country are tackling this problem, looking at other national best practices. And this uh, pyramid just uh, illustrates for all of us uh, the various uh, opportunities of engagement uh, that were included in this process of um, developing a comprehensive uh, housing policy plan. The other um, important piece for us was uh, a commitment to um, real, meaningful community engagement so we did our best to maximize outreach uh, through numerous outlets, uh, through numerous uh, partners. Uh, this you know, also illustrates um, the level of outreach. Um, some of this outreach was done individually by uh, members of our task force. Um, a lot of it was done in partnership with uh, a number of organizations uh, and also with, of course, a number of people that are seated here with us uh, in, in this meeting today. So we started our work about understanding the housing challenges and the housing um, problem um, in San Antonio by uh, looking to inform ourselves about the problem, looking to educate ourselves about the data, and uh, really a commitment to elevating the understanding of housing. And I'll, uh, I'll share with you that um, I had a conversation with Molly Cox uh, from SA 2020 uh, early on in this process, and she shared with me that you know housing is a complex um, issue and thing to to talk about. It's you know so basic. Um, it's such a basic necessity. If, you know, it's when we think about where we live and the memories of our home. Um, that's who we are. That's our identity. But we oftentimes. Um, dismiss it as not being a, a priority, right? Um, or do not um, give you know, housing um, the level of focus or, or, um, or understanding of how families are challenged um, with, when it comes to housing. 
And so we, we determined early on that it was important for us to educate ourselves as a task force, um, but also to develop a process that would lead to educating the, uh, the larger community about the challenges uh, regarding housing. So we uh, created public working meetings. Uh, we held eight public working meetings. Uh, the first one was held in October of uh, 2017. That particular meeting was led uh, with a pre presentation and a discussion on housing um, and neighborhoods um, by looking at it from an equity lens. Uh, we had um, Christine Drennan, Dr. Christine Drennan, uh, provide a presentation and we opened up the conversation. Uh, we also uh, held seven other uh, working group uh, meetings. Um, I know Councilman Trevino was able to join us for one of those meetings. And in fact, this picture that is on this slide was uh, taken on the day of uh, your visit. Uh, this is um, the chief appraiser, um, Michael Mesquita. We had an opportunity to, um, to have a conversation with him about the challenges and issues that families are facing as it relates to property taxes. So throughout you know, this process, um, we listened to uh, experts, to community members. We asked a number of questions on topics ranging from redlining to economic segregation. Uh, to the um, at the Laura uh, tax appraisal process, and also to understanding the current current state of the um, housing trust of the San Antonio uh, Housing Trust, and understanding the potential for it to be a tool uh, to address uh, the housing afford affordability uh, in the future. We also develop. Uh, a very uh, intentional, um, a very intentional public input process. Uh, we um, coordinated three public meetings. Um, the first meeting was held um, at Our Lady of the Lake uh, in Council District uh, Five, and we had uh, the honor of having Councilwoman um, Gonzalez there with us. Um, our second meeting was at Sam Houston High School, uh, and Councilman Shaw was able to join us for that. Uh, and as was mentioned uh, earlier, our final meeting was held at the um, Palo Alto Community College uh, and Councilman Santana was able to join us for, for that uh, particular meeting. And these workshops were, again, um, an opportunity for us to hear directly from residents on their uh, experiences, their perspective, um, their um, concerns, and also their solutions. Um, I talk, you know, I have mentioned that, that this process was data driven, uh, and data is not just um, quantitative data that comes from, uh, you know, economic or market uh, data, but you know, data is also stories, experiences, um, voices, and concerns for residents, and so that this, um, these, you know, uh, public input meetings gave us the opportunity to be able to have basically rich conversations with residents on their perspective of housing, um, and more importantly, on their perspective of how to uh, address um, the challenges um, that neighborhoods are uh, faced with when it comes to housing. And of course, we didn't do this on our own. Uh, we started off, the five of us, mapping out um, this process and we quickly realized that, uh, of course, you know, the, the staff of support was um, instrumental in, in helping to, to guide this process. But we also uh, thought that it was really important to be able to engage uh, some national and local technical support. Uh, these three organizations are all uh, national organizations that are uh, working on housing, housing affordability, uh, and comprehensive community development work across the country. Two of the um, three organizations, uh, NALCAP, the National Association of Latino Community Asset Builders, and uh, the LIS San Antonio, the Local uh, Initiative Support Corporation. Uh, these two organizations have a local presence. They have offices here in San Antonio, and we were able to engage their um, expertise and technical assistance, uh, not only uh, for the task force, but more specifically, <coughs> Uh, to provide uh, facilitation and resource support to the uh, five technical working groups um, that were created and launched in January of this year. Uh, economic planning systems uh, was engaged uh, earlier this year to provide um, data analysis and support, uh, and also they will be assisting us with uh, 
finalizing uh, the report, uh, the policy recommendations, uh, and uh, looking at best practices across the country. So the technical working groups. Um, so we went from five task force members um, to uh, just over 100 uh, members that were involved with um, these uh, five te technical uh, working groups, which really are uh, five housing policy areas that uh, the task force identified um, in December of 2017. As we began looking at uh, the challenges and the problems um, facing San Antonio as it relates to housing, um, we settled on uh, understanding um, the opportunity to develop policies that would lead to creating first uh, a transparent and coordinated housing system, looking at how to improve the coordination not only within the city, but also across the city uh, with uh, other housing providers. Uh, second, uh, we recognize that many of our neighborhoods are experiencing change, and we recognize that it's important um, to be able to identify and understand um, the, the tools that neighborhoods um, should have or be using to um, address some of the changes that are taking place. And this was everything from gentrification to displacement um, to um, con the connectivity that uh, needs to exist within the neighborhood. Uh, the third area of focus for us was um, recognizing that there's not enough federal funding or state uh, funding to be able to solve the housing issue. And to be able to address it comprehensively we thought it was important to uh, look at opportunities for the private sector to be involved and engaged. And the private sector is both um, you know, developers, uh, large scale and small scale, but also um, other um, private partners like uh, employers that are uh, here in San Antonio that are looking to be able to in increase uh, housing availability to their workers. Uh, the fourth area of focus was um, funding and financing and really exploring not only how we're using our current funding streams uh, to expand affordable housing supply, but also identifying uh, new funding and new financing mechanisms uh, to uh, ensure that uh, this uh, issue of um, not having sufficient affordable housing uh, was you know, addressed um, not just with existing federal and state dollars, but also with other funding um, um, dedicated you know, to, to solving for this problem. Uh, and then finally, um, I, you know, I, I shared with you all that uh, a guiding philosophy for the task force was uh, this belief that um, our work was really about ensuring um, that there was housing opportunity for all. And um, what that also means is you know, recognizing that there are segments within our population that um, not only lack access to affordable housing, but in order for them to be able to be successful and stable in housing, there's a need to be able to provide uh, wraparound services or case management services, or really to create um, what we call service enriched housing. So understanding the need uh, for special populations and understanding the best um, practice models to address uh, housing and services was a critical uh, priority for um, the, the task force. So over the course of about four months, uh, the technical working groups uh, met to dive um, into each of their policy area and uh, in May, um, mid-May, they um, wrapped, actually in early May, uh, they were uh, basically, basically they completed their work. We held a two-day session with the co-chairs of each of the technical working groups, and uh, they presented their highest level recommendations. Uh, altogether, we received about 25 overarching policy recommendations. Um, however, uh, this uh, chart represents um, all 300 recommendations, uh, both uh, policy recommendations and uh, implementation strategies. 
Uh, and clearly, as you can see, um, the efforts to make the system more effective, um, the efforts to address uh, creating a coordinated uh, and transparent system uh, were top of mind for many people. It was about 46% um, of all uh, the recommendations. Uh, the second highest was uh, addressing uh, funding, uh, the funding strategy, funding mechanisms, and quite frankly, uh, looking at uh, dedicating new funding sources uh, to address uh, the overall housing need. So where, where are we now? Uh, the, the task force uh, has uh, reviewed uh, data from economic planning systems on uh, trends um, within the city. We have reviewed all 300 recommendations uh, and we are now in the process of um, deliberating and finalizing our highest um, housing policy uh, recommendations. And just you know, quickly, uh, these are the five overarching themes that uh, have been identified that will guide um, the final uh, policy recommendations. The first is around investing uh, in what we call um, a housing ecosystem building uh, local capacity. And building capacity means building capacity and support for um, our city staff and specifically uh, for um, our city department, um, the uh, Neighborhood and Housing Services Department, uh, but also looking at ways to create a stronger, um, a stronger ecosystem within the entire city by um, improving and increasing the coordination among the nonprofit housing providers uh, and other uh, housing um, developers. The second uh, area of focus has been on, or the second theme is uh, establishing dedicated sources of um, funds uh, for housing preservation and construction. Uh, housing preservation for us is um, activities related to um, home um, rehab programs, repair, um, really looking to invest in the current stock of, uh, in our current housing stock. Um, you know that that is um, that, that was also a very um, clear a clear pro problem that was identified throughout the process that we needed to do more uh, to support uh, existing homeowners uh, to increase uh, our current housing stock. Um, and a new construction was both new construction of rental units and multifamily units. The third uh, theme is uh, looking to restructure city strategies for how we deploy housing funds uh, and also how um, that information uh, becomes more accessible and more transparent. Uh, the fourth theme is um, protecting neighborhoods and uh, identifying um, strategies and tools to mitigate displacement. And then finally, um, investing on improving the current regulatory environment. And that includes uh, policy recommendations that uh, also address some of the <coughs> development challenges that small scale developers and large scale developers face when it comes to being able to produce affordable housing. So the, the five of us are um, reviewing um, the nine months of work that has um, been generated through our public working meetings through our public input sessions, through the data uh, that has been um, provided by economic planning systems, but also through the data that has been shared by, by the city staff, uh, through the uh, number of reviewing all of the recommendations, um, and actually have completed the review of all of the recommendations from the technical working groups. And now our focus on is on identifying the highest um, level housing priorities. And as we get to, um, to doing that, you know, we're of course grateful to have the opportunity to be before you, because this is an opportunity for us to hear directly from each of you as to what your highest housing prior priorities are. Um, if there's something um, that was presented that you think is important for the task force to, um, to be able to, uh, to follow up on uh, or to provide more information, our goal, uh, again, is to be able to present the final uh, policy recommendations to council on June the 20th. And then uh, in July, we will be issuing two reports. Um, the first report will be a high-level executive uh, report that includes uh, the housing policies, the problem statements, 
the implementation strategy, the action steps, um, tools that the city may consider uh, using, and also some best practices. And then by August of 2018, uh, we will provide the, uh, the final comprehensive report that will also include um, the uh, documentation, the data uh, generated through technical working groups, uh, and a, a number of other uh, resource um, uh, items. And you know, we think that um, given the timing of um, the, the council's um, deliberation on the budget, this will be an, op uh, an opportunity for the council to be able to look at how uh, we begin to implement um, and how we begin to, uh, to make housing a priority. Uh, again, you know, this is not just about um, identifying housing policy recommendations, but um, truly it's about uh, laying um, a, a blueprint for how we implement um, and how we, we implement and make housing a priority. Uh, specifically um, to address you know, some of the key problem statements. So uh, with that, I, I will um, conclude the presentation and, and uh, open it up for questions um, and a conversation with, uh, with the committee. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, such great uh, information. And um, I, uh, oh, we have, uh, we, let me start with the citizen. We do have one citizen uh, to be heard, um, Barbara Hewitt. <coughs> Right, it's with how with with dash how. Sorry, that's okay. Um, I uh, wanted to come here today because um, I've been attending uh, probably ninety percent of all of the uh, <coughs> sessions, and it's just just fabulous that we're focusing on this. I'm so glad. But um, one of the things that's happened <coughs> is that um, seniors have been kind of left out of the picture. Senior needs, senior housing needs, and I wanted to bring some statistics to you and some of the history of what's been happening. One out of every five San Antonians are seniors over the age of 60. And the senior housing needs were subsumed under the special population subcommittee. And the focus of that committee uh, became residents with disabilities. An unfortunate development as far as uh, uh, we're concerned. Um, there was one person representing um, senior housing needs and that was the art representative who um, out of the 20 folks uh, that were on that subcommittee and our technical working group excuse me and um, she wound up being a, a uh, one of the co-chairs later on in, in the process um, the unfortunate thing about it is is that the statistics uh, right the, actually your city statistics is that only 17 percent of seniors are disabled so for a lot of folks that went, especially to the last meeting, it's just, it's just a really unfortunate thing that people think everyone who's a senior is disabled, because that's not true. Um, so I really believe that seniors lost their place on the subcommittee. Uh, the resolutions and recommendations by both the City County Joint Commission on Elderly Affairs and uh, ARC were not, were not incorporated, even though they were presented. We, we got, unfortunately, spent a lot of money on copies that, that didn't get incorporated. Um, I also wanted to bring this statistic to you. The average Social Security payment for a seniors is $1,200 a month, which is uh, brings you to being uh, at 60% of the uh, average median income in terms of housing need and availability of, of income for that. And so um, I believe that senior housing needs need a more specific representation on the Housing Policy Task Force. Thank you so much. Thank you um, so much. Uh, I know I have quite a few questions, but I can start with my colleagues and if I can start. Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for this. Uh, thank you to everyone being the uh, task force. My other uh, Sarah, uh, Noah, and Jim, uh, sort of this. Uh, Gene as well. I also want to thank all the folks that have supported you in making sure that you guys had all the staff support needed. So I want to thank the staff that, that helped provide uh, support for a lot of the meetings, Peter Zanoni and uh, Erica Soto. Of course, we also have the planning, planning department here as well. 
And I want to thank all the citizens that are here, Barbara, Cynthia, Sima, uh, Anissa. Uh, we've got a lot of great people here, Gemma. Uh, you can see that this is really complex and very uh, difficult issue because it does involve all the different layers and, and uh, unique parts of our society. So uh, I'll start with Barbara with uh, Howell's comments about seniors. <clears throat> I think, I think that is a, it's a great point to make about seniors because much like the housing itself, it, it's sort of this, this symbiotic relationship between the, the health of a person and the health of, of housing and what that means to somebody, right? And how, how that, the house has a, has a real effect. It's, and I think Lourdes, the way you put it, it's, it's part of our identity, but it's, it's almost also part of our health and who we are. And, and so there's so many elements of a house that as we age in place and we age in the home, they really have an effect on our health, they have an effect on uh, our psychology, and, and they really impact us in, in, in such a big way. And so therefore, as you expand outward into the neighborhood, it really is something that we should, should be looking at in terms of you know, the overall connectivity of our society and the health of our society and how, how it looks at itself. There's the identity I think you're talking about. And you know, I think about uh, one of the things that I, I, I hope, because I haven't seen all the recommendations yet, but I, I would hope that we're, as we're looking at some of the recommendations and we think about breaking them down into some short-term solutions as well as the long-term. And when I think about that, I, I, you know, I want to point out that um, you know, time, I think, is probably the biggest priority. What can we do with the time we do have? And how is time either an enemy or a friend? In I mean, the, the perfect case is the roof program that, that we started. The whole point of the roof program is to simply fix a roof. But we know that every day, a roof that's not fixed, it's, it, it just further deteriorates. Not just the roof, not just the structure, sheetrock, or even the furniture, but someone's lives. Right? And this is, I think, what Barbara was talking about. And we've seen a lot of seniors just simply living with the condition of, of an unhealthy, uh, not well-maintained home. And my hope is that, that we can look at the, and I know you are, I know you're looking at the existing housing stuff, but in terms of the short-term and the long-term effects, what we can do a lot of great things in the short term. We really can help to provide that long-term outlook. But in the meantime, we know that there's a lot of seniors simply living with substandard conditions, and, and whether that's just simply a, a leaky roof or holes that allow insects and rodents and you name it, it's just, it's, it's unacceptable. And <clears throat> this, this begins to kind of tie into a lot of what you were saying, and I like the overarching, first of all, I want to compliment the overarching themes, and I think that this is really, um, this is this is really a great formula here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give to you what I what I heard, and then you tell me if I'm on the right track. Um, but again, when we're thinking about issues like the existing housing stuff, because I think that's that's the immediate short term. We've got to say the immediate the, the housing stuff we do have. And that translates to the existing neighborhoods that we have. Um, I think about several things. I think about infrastructure, like sidewalks, like streets, street lights, uh, proper drainage. You know, there's neighborhoods that are affected by all these things, and some of those that don't have any of these things. 
and how do we as a city help to provide and improve that quality of life? Because I, I believe that these things are very much connected. Uh, they're very much they very much connect us to our neighbors, and I think connected neighbors allow us to shine a light, much like your overarching themes, help us to create strategies so that we're we're understanding what we need to establish. How, how do we dedicate the support and the help? People just need to, need to simply know that their neighbor's going through something. They may, not, they may not know it, and we as a city need to know more about what are the exact <coughs> issues happening with individuals in their homes and in their neighborhoods. And so I believe a, a more well-connected city a strong push for for real for basic infrastructure is is going to help with that. Um, another one is intergovernmental. And you put up the slide of uh, uh, Chief Amesquita. And uh, we came up, we came here, we presented about property valuations and what's happening. And of course, we can talk about why some property valuations are happening the way they are. But the thing that we have to pay attention to is where, right? And what we demonstrated that night was we demonstrated that there are areas where there's hot spots where the properties are spiking so tremendously. The change is so great. That's, that's hard to deal with, right? It's, it's the change, the percentage change. And then there's areas where it's the opposite direction, where they're losing the value. And I, I'm, I, I gotta tell you, we have to be equally concerned with those areas because, as we demonstrated, if there's an area that is seeing a huge spike, but another area that's, that's seeing it the other way, you're, you're, you're about to have two different types of crises. One is that, that pushes people out because of affordability. The other one gives or leaves people with money. And that this is what I'm concerned about is that there's large swaths in our community where the values are, are really taking a, a steep dive. And how can we help to stabilize that? Thanks. Bringing, bringing, the back, bringing it back to, to a, to a uh, more of a normalized condition is is going to help both neighborhoods, those that spike up and those that are also losing the value, and that I think is, is critical. What we've also noticed is that a lot of those areas that are losing value don't seem to have the infrastructure investment that we believe makes for healthy, well-connected neighborhoods. Um, so that's just one aspect that. Yeah, the Bear Appraisal District that I think can help us in many ways understand the pockets that are happening. Um, but we got to look at others like CPS, uh, our own entities, and SAWS, and what can, what can we do more intentionally with fees and fee waivers, and what does that mean to development, and what does that mean to uh, working together to describe something that is going to take all these things into account. You know, one of the things I've learned in talking with CPS, SAWS, and their appraisal district is how much they don't talk. And you know, there's there's affordability programs, and and we try to sign people up for affordability programs for seniors, for example. But SAWS is manually doing that when the information is on file at the appraisal district. And so there's 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 opportunity to connect a lot of these uh, strategies that are already in place and they build on that. So it's my hope that we do more or have a have a push for more intergovernmental support. I think the overarching uh, point in your investing efforts to improve the regulatory environment really speak to that. And and then of course. I would point out that how we look at our codes, how we look at our building codes overall, what that means, are we allowing for 
innovative construction? Are we allowing for for new building materials? How do we make how do we incentivize that? The the issue I take with, with building codes is that is that they they're typically reacting to something that's already been done. They're not necessarily promoting or creating a, a setting the table for for innovative building or design. And I think we can we can pursue a lot of that. We can allow some flexibility if we're chasing something meaningful like for the lines. So I, I, I want to push for more of that. And an example of that I would point out is the, the size lots that we have in certain areas, just in my district, um, there are certain lots that, that because of regulatory uh, ordinances that we have in place, it's difficult to put a house on it. But can't we be flexible? Can't we be flexible based on the mission that somebody is trying to take on? And, and so I hope that, that we can look at those kind of things when it comes to a regulatory environment that we, that we can take a more thoughtful approach depending on what the scope of the project is. And, and we can look at those regulatory codes that, that can actually uh, encourage thoughtful developers and, and designers and builders to to create something that I think would help in the situation, maybe even uh, something that we would never thought of. <clears throat> One of the issues that we have been facing, we see it a lot in District 1, but it's we know it's it's an inner city issue. Not so much as the city grew out, but in, in, over time, when the city was laid out, and I'm glad the planning department is here, uh, as we laid out the different lots, there was there was all the history that the city went through, and as you mentioned, you know, uh, Dr. Brennan did a great presentation of, of um, some of the intentional and maybe some not so intentional things that have happened that we have to correct. So we're we're having to kind of go back and deal with a lot of legacy issues. And you know, I'm seeing it. I see it in my district. I know you see it in all the inner city districts. Is the the, the zoning, the planning in in these areas do make a, a significant impact? There are. It, it is. It makes the the issue more complex. And so you're not you're not starting with a clean slate. You're you're starting with history and layers of. of issues that have been put on top and I think Dr. Grant did a fabulous job of illustrating that. But there there lies some opportunity if we say let's be flexible. Let's find some way to be flexible instead of uh, regulatory when it comes to building affordable housing in the inner city. Let's let's work with not not just uh, review, right? And so, uh, yeah. those are my basic thoughts on, on what I think you guys are, are chasing. And um, at the heart of that, we know that we as a city are also in a little bit of a corner because we create, we, we try to improve areas, and as the, the chief appraiser will tell you, we create value. And that value is a double edged sword. Because we don't want we don't we want to create value, we want to improve the quality of life of people in in their neighborhoods and in their areas, but we don't want to create value that pushes people out. And you know, I would lastly say one of the things that we've seen too much of is that we invest in creating value in an area without without us thinking about the calculus of who might be displaced, without thinking about if, if we're thinking about the overall cost of, of a project, Project X, that we think is going to be an amazing, a good add to, to the quality of life and connect our city, can we not include in that calculus a way to respond to the housing 
need in that area and, and the potential displacements, it should be in the calculus from, from the get-go. Just like land acquisition and building costs, and you name it. it. It should be part of our calculus. Instead of us having to figure out after the fact, after we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars, we're investing into something we know we can carve out. We know we can put it in that calculus. And that calculus will help us also create that. One of the best questions is, should we be doing this? You know, and, and, I, and I think it helps us as we're creating this, uh, these, these improvements in our city, because we do want a more well-connected community. We want great sidewalks for people. We want great roads. The drainage project, and there's no reason those things should should be pushing people out of their homes. This is this is our our responsibility as a city. So I so I hope I kind of captured uh, a lot. I mean, it seems like your overarching themes are addressing that. Do you like to maybe yes, I, I just say a few things. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Councilman, for uh, the questions and the comments. Um, outlining your um, key sort of priorities and, and in many ways pretty much every single um, topic that you address um, has been either addressed through the task force or through our technical working groups. Uh, two things that I would say, um, the first point um, on the, the focus on a long-term plan and also some short-term strategies, um, I, I, we're with you on that. Um, this, you know, problem of uh, housing um, rising housing costs, um, the, um, the cost burden on families. This didn't happen overnight. As we saw in the chart, it's a 20 year, it's the 20 years in the making. And so we recognize that in order for us to begin to uh, address the housing issue, we need to start now. Uh, we need to start now, um, but we also need to lay out uh, a 10 year plan. And so what we are looking um, to um, recommend is a 10 year strategy or a 10-year um, implementation plan um, with, with a very specific short-term uh, objectives um, that we hope you all will consider going into this uh, budget uh, year or into this budget discussion. Um, some of you know, the strategies um, you've articulated uh, and you know it is about investing in our current housing stock. Um, we recognize that there needs to be more done to preserve and assist uh, homeowners um, and, um, but it, we also recognize that we need to do more to um, expand the supply of affordable housing. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's critically important um, that we have a long range view, but also that we uh, provide to all of you um, for your consideration some immediate action steps that can be taken to ensure that this problem doesn't um, continue to get worse. Thank you, Liz. And just one last question. Uh, and it, and it struck me uh, in having a conversation with the chief appraiser, Michael Anskita, that he says one of our issues with housing in San Antonio is that we only have a three month supply. And, and, and with regards to how the appraisal districts look at it, a healthy supply is supposed to be a six month supply of housing and stuff. Are, are we addressing that? Are we addressing, I think, what he's saying is it's the overall housing stock itself. And so the, the overall housing stock being so low is creating pressures where they don't, where they don't necessarily have to be. Right, right. It's, it's a combination of uh, increasing housing costs, uh, really related also to the um, imbalance of housing supply uh, to demand. And, and so there's also a data um, point that we can follow up with you and share that shows uh, the growth in terms of population and jobs, um, but the, the number of housing units has basically not um, kept pace with that growth in population and jobs within our city. So that, hence, you know, that creates uh, additional pressure. Um, and you know, I'm gonna uh, ask maybe Jim to chime in on this um, because we've done the analysis to take a look at the number of units that would need to be created over a 10-year period um, to um, to address this problem. Uh, there is. 
Yeah, so we've, we've done the analysis. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we should get too far into the weeds at this point. I think we really need to look at all of this on paper and we're still working through our final recommendations. Um, the, the need is great. Um, what we're showing is that there is a, a very deep, untapped market in the sort of 80 to 150 percent AMI home ownership range. You know, the problem is the market's not producing houses really at that price. Um, and so if, if, if we can find a way to get some more housing built at that price, you know, the market's virtually uh, uh, unlimited. You know, what we've also discovered is that, you know, much as, as we might assume is that there is a, uh, you know, there's a shortage of some 32,000 uh, rental housing units for families that are making below 30% AMI. There's a shortage of another 3,000 or 4,000 units for families making between uh, 30 and 60% AMI. Uh, and those, you know, those are some pretty, pretty big numbers and they're pretty stark. So with, without reviewing kind of specific recommendations, I think our thought is at this point, in order to stabilize the housing market in San Antonio and, and effectively sort of keep things from getting worse just in terms of number of units, we've got to target something like 20,000 affordable housing units in the next 10 years. Thank you guys. Thanks for your hard work on this. And you know, there's lots more to do. And uh, I look forward to working with you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that we need to start at a point where we understand that there's a really is a crisis in housing in San Antonio. We talk about affordable housing being uh, needing 150,000 units to really accommodate um, the population. I don't know if your research has verified that that's a fairly accurate number, but that's what we've heard a lot of. That we, we could use 150,000 uh, units that would be livable, that uh, would be uh, you know, sustainable. Uh, of course, we have people living in housing units today that are certainly substandard, and we want to improve their quality of life in those homes. So if we're talking about 150,000 units, uh, it seems to me that that's something we just simply can't build our way out of even in 10 years or 20 years. So it really has to be a combination of uh, single family, new single family homes, which are really the most expensive and, and probably get developed in the least numbers compared to then multifamily. We need to have more multifamily apartment complexes that people can feel proud of living in. But also I think we need to renovate or re rehab probably 50,000 homes in this city where people are living today that if we could help re rehab that home with a new roof, new electricity, uh, you know, stabilize the foundation, uh, you know, just some paint, good sidewalks outside, people who are living in those homes would love to live in those homes another 20 years. And so I think that's the overall uh, target I would like to see us come back with is how are we going to meet those kinds of needs? How many new homes do we want to build every year? How many uh, multifamily apartment units do we want to build? How many rehab homes do we want to build to achieve the idea of getting everybody in a, a safe and affordable home? Uh, but also I think we need to look at uh, what are the development barriers that, that need to be removed in order to do that? Or on the other hand, what are the incentives that can be put in place to do that? Because certainly there's both. It may be new home development. There's a lot of uh, builders who say there are barriers to doing that. Uh, there are certainly barriers to rehabilitating homes as well. Uh, one of the problems I see is that when the city looks at any kind of rehabilitation, they want everything brought up to today's high standards of codes and, and uh, building uh, quality and everything. People are living in homes today that weren't built that way. And a lot of those homes are still very livable. Maybe they need a roof, maybe they need electricity, but to say that the city or the community can afford to invest $80,000 or $100,000 in all of those homes that might be worth 50, 60, 70,000 is so impractical, but we say we have to do that because we've got to build, to build to today's standards and today's building codes. And I'm wondering if we can't find a median position 
where we can establish some rehabilitation codes that provide safe, safe housing, healthy housing, without having to meet those codes that we've put in place for new housing today. I realize that's, that's probably a very questionable thing to consider, but if we can reduce the financial burden on rehabilitating homes where people can continue to live another 20 years and, and be happy and healthy in there, then that's a lot more affordable, a lot more achievable than rehabbing all these homes up to the modern standards that we demand. So, you know, those are barriers or incentives I think we need to look at. Um, another thing is when we look at developing new homes, uh, and particularly I would say uh, multifamily homes, if it's getting a subsidy from the city, then I'd like to see us not coming out with properties that have 50% market rate and 50%, 80% AMI. Those are way too expensive for probably 30, 40% of the people who live in the city. We need to have lower AMIs. We need to have 60% housing. You were even talking about how there are 30,000 people living in, in an economic situation between 30 and 60,000 AMI or, or percent that need housing. And so if we're gonna be incentivizing uh, development of multifamily housing and even, uh, you know, single family housing, I think we need to be able to create the kind of housing that people who are earning $35,000, dollars $45,000 a year can afford to move into, whether it's apartments or housing. I know those are challenges, uh, but I'm wondering if we can find a way to develop the financial wherewithal, uh, the, the opportunity to provide tax incentives somehow to create that kind of affordable housing instead of everything at 80% and maybe 10% at 60, 5% at 30, and, and you know, 75% of the market. You know, not, I, I agree, we've got plenty of market people who want to buy homes or live in nice uh, apartments and pay $1,700, $1,800 a month. But we need to accommodate those 450, the 750, the $900 a month families too. So I'd like to see some of that in, in the plans that come out. Um, also, I think that's going to take uh, the city maybe having to expand our authority and our own charter to be able to do some of this. And I don't know if you're going to be coming forward with a recommendation for a charter revision so that the city can be a greater player financially and in the uh, development of housing. But right now, we're very limited, very structured in what we can do. And, and it is a city problem. So, you know, I'd like to see us look at that. I think we need to find more financial and funding resources. Uh, another concern is when we talk about providing resources that are out there today, we need to better educate buyers and tenants on what those resources are out there to assist them. It's, it's something as simple as uh, rehab money that we have available, or the city will help pay for the repair of a sidewalk, or, there are so many different projects, little pieces, bits and pieces, and it's, you know, CPS energy coming in and helping the house become energy efficient. I don't think people know enough about that, particularly people who are struggling, uh, you know, just to make ends meet. They haven't been able to invest the time to understand all of those opportunities, and we need to help provide them with that information so that they can maintain where they are and make it more affordable for them. Uh, another concern I have is tenants' rights. And I think you alluded to that, Councilman, when you talked about the great development that went on in San Pedro Creek, but there were literally hundreds of families being moved out because of that development. So they're never going to enjoy it. But other people who are willing to pay twice the price for the rent will. We need to think about the unintended consequences of the development that the city and the county share and, and promote uh, and how it affects the uh, affordability of housing for people who live in those areas. Can they continue to enjoy the improvements that are being made, or are they going to be forced out? So what kind of tenant rights, uh, you know, what kind of displacement obligations even can we put on, on developers, property owners, if they're going to do that? Uh, you know, should they share some of the responsibility? Because they're going to share the gain when they 
bring new higher paying people in. I think that um, another thing I want us to think about is the steps to maintain livable neighborhoods. And a lot of that is going to have to do with some of the zoning that we're going to come out with. You know, we're looking at our, our citywide plan, uh, what kind of zoning changes, how will that affect the existing plans that are in place today. How can we protect the, the quality of the neighborhoods that exist? I have a big problem with the development of short-term rentals and what they're going to mean to the quality of life in neighborhoods if the city doesn't have some serious uh, limitations on that. Uh, and, and I already have people coming to me in, in my area, on the north side, saying, you know, we've got people buying houses, they're turning them into short-term rentals. It's, and they're having big parties, they're having all kinds of things go on in the neighborhood that the neighbors have never been in, used to and didn't move into that residential area to have happen around them. And so that's protecting the quality of life in those areas that I think we need to work more on. That should be part of what you come out with, with your recommendations. Another thing is I think that we should be looking at reclassifying what we call affordable housing and workforce housing. Because we're looking at workforce housing at 80% of AMI or higher. And we're looking at affordable housing at you know 30% up to 80% or something like that. And, and, or 60. And what that means is when people in many communities around the city hear, oh, we're going to have affordable housing in our area, they're thinking, uh-oh, it's going to be a bunch of poor people who don't know how to take care of their properties moving into my neighborhood in a new apartment or something like that. And the word affordable, I think, is being mischaracterized. But every one of those, those um, zones of qualification are, include people who are working for a living. And so all of that really is workforce housing. Maybe some people are only earning $30,000, but they're working. So it is workforce housing. That's what we should be emphasizing to the public so that they get over that misperception that it's going to be detrimental to their neighborhoods. I've been out and looked at several great properties that were developed that are workforce housing complexes like Prospera and Mike Hogan. And some of these builders are building quality that anybody would love to live in, but because it may be labeled as workforce housing, communities say, we don't even want it in our neighborhood. So, you know, I think that we need to look at calling it workforce instead of affordable and uh, promoting it more in many areas of town. Um, so I think those are some of the, the feedback, some of the deliverables I'd like to see come from the committee that would get us on a track with very specific things that we should be working on and accomplishing every year for the next 10 years if we're going to meet this need. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, Councilman, for uh, the detailed list. And these are um, important uh, issues for us also, and it's very important for us to to be as specific as possible. And so I appreciate um, your um, basically having you go through every sort of aspect of this comprehensive plan. Um, I do want to uh, uh, just sort of draw the attention um, to a point that you made about workforce housing. Uh, and this is the first, um, th I think this is really the first time we've had this level of conversation about redefining uh, affordable housing and understanding that we have many, many families that are working, that are working for that, um, that are within the 30% AMI or 30 to 60% of AMI. And so I think what you have uh, shared um, with us is something that we will um, uh, consider uh, very thoughtfully because there is, um, there is a uh, misunderstanding um, and, um, and quite frankly, I think that there is um, not enough information about what um, housing that is affordable really is. And you know, automatically, I think individuals go into um, a certain negative perception about who's going to live in that housing. So having us rethink the definition and how we describe that uh, will be critically important. Uh, and I also you know, want to acknowledge uh, that, uh, Councilman, that we were very, very thankful that you were uh, at every single community public input meeting 
um, and you um, were there to listen, um, to participate, and, and also, you know, now to, of course, offer your perspective. And so we very much appreciate uh, your commitment uh, to this work. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And if, uh, I've been attending committee meetings for a few years, and if the barometer of the interests and importance of the issue is how many questions and comments council members have, uh, then this is a good indication of uh, a really important topic because I've gone to committee meetings where there's no questions asked from committee members. In this case, we've got two uh, detailed lists, monologues of work because we care so much about this issue and it's true that I think Council Courage and Council Trudy have been following this at every step. Uh, and each one of them has a different sort of flavor to uh, their recommendations and, and their pieces. For me, I just want to have uh, a quick dialogue because I know how important it is that you all, to, to really call out the amount of work and effort that you all have put into this. And I've been part of a lot of strategic designs and retreats and work sessions that lead to a final document, or I think the closest thing I can get to that piece, the final themes, is, is your overarching themes on slide uh, 13. And I think as I'm looking at each one of the five, I got a really good sense of uh, the bottom four. The first, I'd like to get in your in your heads a little bit to understand how it is that you are, I, I'm just trying to understand the first bullet, I understand the, the last four. But I'd love to know the, the workings and the conversations that you all had internally to get to the first uh, recommendation of the larger thing, which is to invest in improving the housing ecosystem, capacity, and accountability. Uh, that's a big, those are three big themes, so three, three big ideas. Can you just help me understand them, how you got to them, what, what you're driving towards in recommending that? Because I know that when you're doing these things, every word seems to matter uh, when you're saying, look, these are the overarching things we're going to provide to the community committee, to the council, to the policymakers, to the writers who are going to be digging into that. So tell me about what you all are thinking here when you came up with the first one. Yeah, certainly, uh, Councilman. I'm going to ask <coughs> uh, Councilwoman uh, Mariana Mendel de Dios Salon to lead the conversation in terms of what led um, to this focus on developing a coordinated housing system and, uh, and, and really beyond developing a coordinated housing system it's really an ecosystem that starts within the city, that carries out uh, within the city um, staff, within the city government, that it carries out you know, to the rest of our city through the participation and the coordination and the focus on metrics um, and how we're spending our dollars um, across the board, from the housing authority to the housing trust, um, to the nonprofit housing providers, to also the um, private you know, developers. And so, um, I'm going to maybe ask Maria to just give us a, a summary of how we got to this place, and then uh, and then we can give you a little more um, sort of detail in terms of the vision. A summary, indeed, which will be uh, very difficult for me uh, because <clears throat> I started looking at this from a history of 30 years, and uh, to see uh, what we were doing 30 years ago, where housing was not even in the radar, and that there are community people who have been. Uh, wanting us to do something for that long. Uh, but I did a, uh, it starts with implementation. And that it doesn't matter how many studies and reports we create, that if there is not an implementation process, it will not be done. And I did uh, <coughs> extensive research. I went back to 1997, where the city created a master plan. There was a, another plan, It's a, and I have a list that I'll be happy to share with you. Uh, there was another one done in, uh, in 2009. Uh, it was a strategic plan. Then there was SA 2020, and there was SA Tomorrow. And I have a list of 10 that have been done. So I went in to see all the recommendations. There's some recommendations that have been repeated over and over, and they haven't been implemented. So what we decided is we need to make sure that a major part of our report is going to be how do we do this? because. I don't think our constituents, your constituents, want, you know, five, ten years from now to come along, uh, Councilwoman, and uh, the, uh, what was recommended is, is not done. So what it is, is to making sure that the city has the capacity and 
the resources to implement what is being decided. Uh, just a little um, piece of information here. Some of what you all discussed today, what the working groups came to us with, have already been recommended. Uh, I, I carry with me the 17 recommendations of SE Tomorrow and Housing. The displacement issues that, uh, that you brought up, there are three that have to do with that. One of them is to create a relocation plan. Uh, there are two others. Uh, so whose responsibility was it to do that? So that's part of our city's ecosystem. And to have um, uh, capacity high enough in the management plan that they can oversee what you have brought up, planning, um, neighborhood housing services, uh, uh, human services. Uh, housing is across the board, and there needs to be a high enough um, official in the city. Uh, our uh, task member who's not here, um, Jean Dawson, has reminded us over and over that housing needs to be infrastructure. It's the fourth leg of a stool. That is housing, uh, energy, transportation, and water. So, that's, so if we raise housing to the level of infrastructure, we will have corresponding um, management capacity and funding so that our report is not going to be another one that I can go back and do research and say it wasn't done. The, the level of management has to be at a level where they also are able to work with the county and with VIA and with the housing authority and with developers. Uh, so that's what the ecosystem is. It's a system that raises housing to a very high level. And in your vote during the, uh, uh, the goal setting session, when you uh, added housing to your list of priorities, you have already done it. And we really want to thank you for doing that because that was a historic uh, decision that had never been made. You all already made housing a priority. So now we have to put, um, we have to you know, recommend something that we feel will make it possible for us to have that system that is not only internal but external. Uh, and, uh, and that this time you all will have something that will be there for you know, 10, 15, 20 years. I think you mentioned 300, and and I like that. I like that. 300 is the number of these days. The one last thing that I would just add um, that uh, that is part of this uh, ecosystem is also ensuring that we are um, providing resources mm -hmm. and services in a coordinated way to to residents. Uh, to individuals that are looking for um, housing opportunities, to individuals that, that are looking to buy their, uh, their first home that they don't know how to start the process. One of the technical working groups um, described um, the um, interest in creating a housing uh, one-stop um, center. Uh, and so the coordination means you know, coordinating how we do the work, how we innovate, how we uh, implement and um, employer dollars, but it also means uh, how we uh, provide information and make information more accessible and available to individuals that are struggling with housing. Uh, so that's part of the ecosystem as well. Lourdes and, and Maria, thank you for, for making this, how you make this particular bullet point make sense. What you've, so, what you've said, here's what I take from it, is that I think I find myself often repeating the same line, which is that if it's not measured, then it doesn't get done. And what I would take from this is that I would hope that this council, uh, that your recommendations reflect that if our city manager is not, does not have a line item on her metrics for success, and we provide a great assessment of her job that deals with housing and recommendations that come from this task force then we may have failed because if it is not driven from the top level of administration to your point accountability and capacity if it's not driven from that top level if they get lost if if Peter Zanoni who oversees this but also has a branch of 12 other folks who have a toe in this piece if Peter Zanoni's job is not dependent on his ability to drive the outcomes in this then he might not worry about it as much and the accountability may not exist. 
So it, it may just end up being in a presentation or great task force or great set of recommendations until it's driven by some accountability. And I think that's the direction to us here and I hope you reflect it um, because I'm ready to say that there, there should be an indictment on the city that has seen so many recommendations go unfulfilled because there hasn't been somebody to really take hold of them and, and, and through the thread of capacity. A city, manager, city manager in my mind makes a lot of sense because uh, you know, we've gone through eight, I got through close to eight years on the council and you know, we've changed mayors, we've changed council members, but if the main stay force is the city manager who cares about this issue because it's part of her matrix and assessment and bonuses are tied to it and, and, and uh, compensation is tied to it, then I think it gets done. Um, so I think that's what you're driving at here. And that, I think what that direction to the city manager is that we need to consolidate this in a place where we can measure it, we need to consolidate this so that anybody who deals with issues of displacement, issues of code issues, and issues of regulation around housing um, is in, in one place that we can actually manage an outcome. So that helps me a tremendous deal in understanding what you mean by improving the housing ecosystem, capacity, and accountability. And I want to see a cascade effect for the rest of the four which is that part of it is you want to establish some housing, uh, uh, some sources of funds for housing and preservation, restructuring of current funds, uh, protecting neighborhoods and mitigating displacement, which I think is going to require some of the funds from the top two. Uh, and then, of course, somebody who has to really dig into uh, providing recommendations for the regulatory environment. I believe that's what we'll see in the final recommendations that come out from folks who live this every single day, deal with the code uh, uh, rules that are written. Um, and so, thank you for helping me understand the overarching theme. And I think what the most important overarching theme is that one at the top. Uh, because you're, you're right, it you can't get lost that this is not seen as important as transportation. It's not seen as important as uh, water or utility uh, or, or passing a bond every few years and implementing uh, uh, that bond. Because you can consider that comparable is how we build the infrastructure for our bond every single year. It takes us four years. And when we measure whether we are doing right by the community who voted on them, we have a website that tracks the progress of every single project, every dollar spent. Uh, there's a lot of capacity and accountability built into that system. I wonder if we could do the same. Uh, it starts with the importance of this council, making sure that we're putting the foot down and saying it's important to us, but also uh, relaying that message to uh, our management and our staff uh, to make sure that we are, are doing this in a way that we can drive outcomes that we can point to that are measurable, uh, then we make sure this isn't a presentation or set of recommendations that collects the dust. So um, I didn't think we were, uh, I didn't think we were going to be able to explain it in that way, but I, I appreciate you helping me get there um, and understanding that. The, uh, la the, the last thing I, I would say is just to echo what Councilman Courage said around this issue of, I think he's called it tenants' rights, I've heard it as, as renters' rights. We know that one of the biggest issues that we saw are the folks or the capacity we had. I think it was presented during our goal setting. Um, I'm going to look in the direction of that. But I remember in my mind thinking, oh my gosh, the problem really, if you looked at the whole, three quarters or two thirds is about renters. What was the, what was the line to be? Uh, can you chime in and, and remind me again, Peter Ovedo? I think so I think better to go. Forty-eight percent of renters uh, are cost burden. Forty-eight percent of renters, twenty-one percent of homeowners are cost burden. Yeah, you all have it as well. You all are singing the same 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 song. Um, and so when I think about what we need to do in terms of seeing the recommendations around what renters' rights exist, what uh, displacement obligations, as I think the way has some courage put it, uh, because I, what, what I would like to see from you all are very bold recommendations. I, I don't want to create a fog, I want you to be very direct with us and, and ask us to do things maybe we've never done before because I think that's the level of commitment we need to have to have an effect on what we believe is going to be a crisis. So please don't be afraid to offer recommendations about significant code changes, significant uh, improvements to our regulatory environment, or even significant investments around creating a source of funds um, that may include a charter change that we can pass, something like a housing bond, that may include some a general funds set aside for displacement or uh, what understanding of how we uh, create assets, whether that be general fund or assets in, in removing regulations. Uh, 
please don't be afraid to present some very bold ideas to us that might be able to take action on it. Um, that's, that's the last piece that I've got. Thank you for your work. Um, the reason we're here today is because we know that the free market on its own is not going to take care of the most vulnerable. Uh, and you all have told us exactly who the most vulnerable are. And in many cases, you can probably tell us is it what our census tracks. Uh, and that doesn't come together without a lot of significant work and study. So uh, thank you to Noel, Jim, Maria, to do this, uh, for getting us this far. And Gene, uh, uh, we really appreciate you all doing a lot of the tough work and us just thinking that uh, uh, I would say who would tell what we Deciding, influencing, and holding the outcome. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Councilman. And, and I also just want to reiterate my concerns that the Councilman suggested about having this, giving the staff the direction to include housing as part of their uh, infrastructure plan or a part of our uh, whole development. And I think we have not really done that before. And uh, you know, even Beto sitting over there with 10 vacancies in her department. And I think it's also because we haven't prioritized housing uh, in the city. Um, I don't know what other vacancies look like, so maybe that's not a fair comment, but I would be very surprised if they have equal vacancies in every city department. So uh, I think as we're going through and making these priorities, I think that's going to be very important. Um, and making it part of the city manager's uh, initiative is to make sure that we include housing. So. Um, I, ha I do have some questions that are a little bit more basic, and then I, I, I will um, give you all some updates that we've been, uh, we have in our pilot program that's going on in District 5 related to housing. But um, just even regarding the community outreach piece, um, I was really impressed with all the people that came. And I'm, I want to ask about how that went about, if you had repeat, if it was mostly the same people over and over again. I know that you had technical groups, but then you had community groups. Um, and so could you give us, uh, I don't know if you could give me feedback on um, why you think the outreach was most successful this time? Yeah, I, I think that it was, uh, thank you Councilwoman uh, for, for the question. With regard to outreach, uh, we were very intentional. We wanted to, um, to ensure that um, residents uh, from all over the city had maximum opportunity to participate. Uh, we also, uh, with the help of the city staff, set up a website um, to provide information, to make um, information available in terms of the presentations, but also in terms of meeting notices. Um, at our last meeting at Palo Alto Community College, uh, we had the opportunity of using um, a voting device uh, to get a little more sort of information from the attendees. And one of the questions that we asked was around uh, whether um, this was the first time um, that someone had attended a, a, a housing meeting, and 30% of the attendees um, at that um, community input meeting, it was their first meeting. Um, and for us, you know, that was really important because people are still engaged. Um, the, the other extreme was about 60% uh, had been to all three uh, community public meetings. So we had, you know, uh, the, the consistency and the commitment from a number of um, residents but also the ongoing interest, um, especially because we move these meetings, you know, to different parts of the city. Um, so I, you know, I think that our approach again to um, community engagement was very non-traditional. Uh, it was very bottoms uh, up. Uh, we ensured that everything was um, in both English and Spanish. We uh, also worked with the city staff to have transportation services available. Uh, and to the extent possible, we try to also provide um, opportunities to video stream or live or you know, create videos to, to make that available. Were you able to have those video streamed or download them so we could download and hear them at another date? We, we have some, some of our public working meetings um, were uh, recorded early on. Uh, the last meeting, we had someone in the audience who recorded the meeting. Like uh, he was a, he was a, uh, a resident participant uh, who recorded uh, the the overall meeting and um, posted it on social media. So we, we have a number of recordings, um, and those are available on the website. Okay. Well, hopefully we can get better at that. Um, you know, it was brought to my attention, and uh, I thought it really important when I saw the mother walk in with the children, and I thought how hard that was for her. Imagine how hard it was for her to get there, <coughs> and then having to leave because the children were. Um, you, had, you did have child time? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, um, wonderful. Well, you know, maybe we consider that in, 
in our other meetings as well to see how we make that happen so that we can have more community participation because I mentioned she would have liked to stay but I know the feeling of going through a lot of trouble to get somewhere and then I just have to leave because we, we don't get cooperation. I want to just a little bit uh, of it. We um, showed you the, uh, the circle of the individuals that were invited uh, and I I would like to, you know, thank some people, young people, who took time to leaflet in the neighborhoods. They actually took our flyers and they leafleted. Uh, I don't know how many people showed up as a result of that, but that's that's including them in the process. <clears throat> and the other one is inviting organizations that are not on any of the city's lists. Veronica used all the lists that she has. Had we used uh, SA twenty twenty. Uh, we use Facebook, the mayor's office, and social media. But we also, and I, I want to thank um, um, Noah Garcia because he sent notices to the chambers, uh, and and we did have individuals uh, show up from the chambers. So, and the other one is these small community groups that are in no one's list, but they're very active in the communities and they really reach out to the grassroots. And what we'd like, we'd like for the city to use this process in implementing the plan. There will be opportunities where the public is going to have to finish out our recommendations. And we, we suggest that um, this process be used so that it will really be broad uh, and that we can reach out to people that don't normally participate in the city. Well, thank you. And I, I, I would agree with you. I thought it was really fantastic participation. And I know that um, you know, as we're trying to touch different segments of the population, for a variety of things, you know, getting people where they are is most important. And I'm very sympathetic to young mothers because um, well, I'm not young. I should say mothers of young children, um, because uh, it's very hard to participate even after hours. Because then you, but you had the babysitting, so that's great. Um, another question that I had a little bit more um, uh, about just sort of the process that you all used. Um, one of the questions, or I mean, again, you mentioned ten that you hope to have a working document that would be useful for 10 years. Why did you come up with 10 years? Well, we, it is a very sort of common practice when we look at uh, housing plans to look at, um, at it from a 10-year perspective. Uh, we, we, you know, we also talked about um, the importance of building capacity and, and you know, as we look at a building capacity, uh, we thought, you know, starting off with understanding um, in the first three years, what are the necessary um, steps that need to be uh, put in place um, to be able to, um, you know, to carry us, you know, up up to through the ten ten year period? Um, I, you know, I, I think we we basically um, think it's also important to come up with a plan that's realistic. Um, Councilman Courage mentioned uh, this number of 150,000 uh, units. Um, when we started this effort. You'll recall that um, the 2013 Comprehensive um, Housing Needs Assessment indicated that there was a need of 150,000 units. And when we started to drill down and, and take a look at you know, that number, we realized that that number was a combination of um, households that are uh, spending more than 3% of their income on cost burden, um, units or housing that is substandard that needs you know, to be rehabilitated, uh, and then just not having adequate supply of housing, uh, and and so uh, so there was some duplication in those numbers, and you know thinking about a number as big as 150,000 uh, can be overwhelming for a community, especially a community that uh, maybe has not uh, been very intentional about making housing a priority. So we felt that it was important to come up with a realistic plan uh, that was grounded on um, very sort of um, logical, um, methodical steps to build capacity and, you know, to get us to producing units, um, uh, as mentioned by the councilman, units that are not just rental units, but also looking at home ownership or single family homes, uh, and also uh, looking at uh, investing in um, the, the current housing stock or looking at renovation and rehabilitation of housing. Thank you. Um, for that explanation. Uh, let, let me give you um, some information about the pilot program. So we have the pilot program for, um, I know you all are very familiar with it, but we have a pilot program running in District 5 um, regarding housing. And it was, uh, you know, it came because so many of my constituents said primarily what 
they said they needed help with this owner occupied rehab. But we had our first housing um, program, and, and we do have a housing center running out of Mock the Me Mexican American Unity Council. It's open today uh, for residents of District 5 uh, to deal with many of the issues. But I want to I'm going to read for, for you all the list of what um, was the priorities when people came to the housing <coughs> program. Uh, the number one item and I'm reading in here: estate planning and title issues preventing rehab loans transfer to offering or selling. Thus, the stifling investment and updating older housing stock. The second one was lending. Of, no, I'm sorry, lack of lending products that permit buying and remodeling in one mortgage, preventing young families from moving from renters to ownership in the neighborhood. Financial counseling to guide renters and owners. The need for local contractors that are certified and dedicated to work in areas to prevent scams. Support for property owners and small-scale developers to build single-family and multi-family hub units. Reduce permit zoning and other barriers that increase price of small development. So this was targeted at District 5, but they were residents from 47 of the city's 82 zip codes that attended that fair. So, um, and, and part of that housing pilot was funded with the, our general fund dollars, about 50,000. Um, a total of about 75,000 of city fund funds. Uh, and then we got uh, about another 100,000 from the private sector to contribute. And so I guess one of my questions, uh, Noah, I think is to you, um, and I mean, I understand that we're still in the pilot phase, but what is the private sector doing to help? I mean, we, we know that we need to start at the city to um, create like, um, policies that will enable, but it, it really it has to come from the private sector. Is there, um, and I, I, I'm grateful, I know that we have several private sector uh, members as well. What is this, the feeling? You know, they, and I really think from the private sector side um, that the difficulty is is the cost to produce housing. And, uh, and with the barriers that are there, there's no market that is being developed uh, because of land costs, because of development costs, and, and housing costs. So there, there is a, uh, and, and if you're talking about private sector from the development side, or is it more from the private sector of businesses? Well, no, I'm mostly thinking about um, access to mortgages and the development sector. And, and I'm going to preface this with um, a little bit of information also that was, that was, uh, there was a, a study that was commissioned by the Housing Commission, I think not this task force, but the Housing Commission, uh, that showed that it was more expensive to develop in the urban area, but actually was a benefit to the city within the first year of development, and that any development, residential development outside of 410 was actually um, negative to the city for residential housing. So. Can you elaborate on, I'm sure you're familiar and, with And I'm going to defer to Jen, who is really the expert in that area, and we're the and one so, that's continuing the housing commission, but let me answer that Okay, question. thank you. I sort of two-part then, like the private sector in terms of offering uh, more availability for mortgages and different options. So um, let, me, let me address the first part of your point. The first part of your point, and then turn it over to Lourdes to address. You know, I think what the what the private sector is doing or is capable of in in terms of finance. Um, she and I have had a, a couple of meetings about this, and I know it's been been engaged in some of this too. Um, regarding your your question about, I think what you're referring to is the the Pregnancy and Associates study that looks at the um, the fiscal impact of various development patterns. Um, and I'm sorry, just to interrupt, is that, is that study available to the public? It's, a, it's Perhaps available. we can get it, yeah. and maybe it's already online, but if it's not, it's cool. Yeah. So it, it addressed some concepts that we've started to see float up over the last 10 years or so. And, and it's important, but I think it was the, the big takeaway for all of us in the Housing Commission is that, yes, it's, it's cheaper to provide city services to folks who are living tied in, you know, they need they need um, fewer cars, you know, public transportation systems work. But the, you know, the, the, the big takeaway is that the poor San Antonians fundamentally can't afford an auto-dependent 
lifestyle, right? You know, a, a family that's making below 30% AMI. I use this example a lot. Um, Alamo Community Group um, runs a, uh, a project in the Calcasieu building, and they have, I think it's something like 63 units. And of those, and of those units, the occupants own a total of seven cars, right? So it's affordable housing, and they're not spending what San Antonians spend, which is a, an average of 23% of their income every year on, on transportation. Um, so we thought it was, was useful in that regard. Um, regarding, um, you know, sort of um, the concept of, of affecting change on larger development patterns, I think we felt like that was a little outside the scope of, of, of our work. Um, but we chose instead to focus in on the things that we thought directly contributed to the housing problem. And then I'll, was that an an yeah, answer you were that, looking forward to that is, question? Yes, um, yes, and I, I thank you for that. Um, although I would, um, then if it is outside of your scope of work, then whose work is it? Because I think that's really important because we know that within the crag actually <laughs> is the best um, impact for the city. Is most benefit for the nation. So uh, you know. So if it's not no, no, if it's I, not you, then I think it needs to be addressed in some way. And so is that as us as policymakers, uh, how we can continue to um, to to do that? Because historically, as you all know, that the crag historically has not been invested in uh, from an infrastructure perspective. So we're just starting to make some ground in that regard. So um, as we continue to make policy decisions. How can we continue along that path? And perhaps it goes back to what Councilman Savani was saying about making sure that um, the city is responsible for presenting that information. So uh, I'll, I'll let you pass it over. Then. Sure, and I will just say that we, we're making our recommendations entirely cognizant of the goals of SA tomorrow and the VIA 2040 long range plan as, as we talk about. And as it, as it passes by me, I'll just say that it's an issue of coordination and priority. So just, just building on what uh, my colleague uh, Jim and Noah mentioned, first of all, and then he also recognized that the work that you're doing, Council Woman and District 5, is critically important, and we're looking at your model of the housing, um, the Comprehensive Housing Center, as, um, as a model um, for how we think about develop, developing um, a, a one-stop housing um, center. Um, we know that you know, you're in the very preliminary stages and, and, and uh, still you know, gathering information in terms of impact. Uh, but within the report, we think it's important to point to um, some of the uh, programs that have been either initiated by a council member or that are in place that are working um, that need uh, some additional support or infusion of dollars. So I just wanted to acknowledge and, and recognize you know, the, the great work um, of uh, MOC um, and all of the other partners that, that have been part of um, this effort. Um, and then secondly, I would say that in terms of the, the role of the private sector, um, and I think the best example of this is the, um, the Center City Housing um, Incentives Program, right? Um, it was designed as an economic development um, uh, program to create more housing in downtown um, and it was a very predictable system uh, with incentives um, and developers like that they like predictability and they like also opportunities you know to be able to reduce their risk um, and from our perspective uh, councilwoman we think it's important for us to uh, develop a system very similar to that for affordable housing um, to the city has the experience and the capacity uh, within development services. You know, uh, there's a one-stop you know approach. There's great capacity. Um, there's you know great capacity within the um, the center city housing uh, investment program. And as we look at you know finalizing our recommendations, we're looking at the models that are already in place in the city and looking at their uh, applicability to affordable housing. Is it possible for us to be able to come up with um, a, a, an approach that allows for um, small-scale developers or large-scale developers to come to one place, 
um, to navigate, you know, the um, land use, you know, code uh, process, permit process, um, so that the end goal is that we are producing more affordable housing. So that's the level of um, um, thinking, and that's you know the level of, um, of focus that we have when it comes to what can we do to incentivize. Um, private sector partners uh, to come to the table because again this you know this housing problem or crisis cannot be solved alone with uh, federal dollars or state dollars or local dollars we need our uh, private sector partners at the table well, thank you and uh, just one final question regarding some of the uh, demographics and the research um, one of the things that uh, was also uh, brought to my attention uh, regarding the demographics is, you know, we talk about the growth of the city uh, and the number of people that are coming, but that in fact the growth is generated primarily from Latino families who already live within the, the city. Uh, but I just showed that I'm doing my part to <laughs> increase um, the number of Latino families in this community. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then two part to that is that I, you know, I also learned that 80% of my population, of my district, is 35 and younger. And so I guess, are you taking those two demographics into consideration when you're doing your, your recommendation that it's largely Latino families that already live here and that um, we have such a young population? Or at least we do District 5, but even citywide, I think it's been presented that we actually have a very young city. Right. We, we are definitely um, looking at um, the demographics of our city. Uh, one of our public working um, group uh, working meetings, um, we invited um, Dr. Science from um, UTSA to provide a presentation on um, the, the changes in population. Um, and it was very clear to us, as you um, indicated, that, uh, that San Antonio is uh, largely Latino uh, and also a very young population. Uh, so as we think about uh, the importance of um, making housing information available, um, and, and actually this also came up through one of our technical working groups, they were looking at um, incorporating um, technological sort of platforms, you know, to be able to connect with um, younger populations, right? It's not just sort of the physical place, but it's also how you make that information available. So we are you know, definitely considering um, the demographics um, and you know, really at the end of the day, this has been a very um, locally driven process. It's been about what is happening in our city, what has happened over the last 20 years, where are we now, what do we need to do to um, course correct and to address the problem before it becomes a larger you know, crisis. And then also understanding maybe how other cities are tackling this issue, um, but not necessarily just sort of take taking sort of what they're doing, but you know, looking at does it fit, you know, to to our does it fit within our city? Is it appropriate for us? Um, and and so all that to say is that you know we we think it's important to uh, to ground this in um, the population that we serve um, and and also to recognize and acknowledge that um, it has it's very diverse, it's changing, um, and it's you know very young. Um, so. So we will be incorporating that in, in the narrative um, and in the approach to um, our policy recommendations. Right, I think that's very important because even I had an image of you know people coming flooding in from other places um, that it wasn't necessarily an organic process, but um, apparently that's the case. Uh, great. Well, thank you all so much. I think that was all the questions I had or comments that I had. Um, I think Councilman Courage and the others also touched on the need for uh, more public housing for the population that is uh, below the 30%. Uh, I think that's an important issue as well, and I think I'll touch on that. So um, and I think we're, um, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. This is um, really so uh, important and, and really exciting, uh, I think, as policymakers to have some direction um, from experts like yourself. So thank you all so much. Um, and then, so I know that you're still working through some details that we look for. Um, it, did we? Did you have to extend the timeline, or how are we with that formal?
So next week on June the 20th, um, the five of us as a task force will be presenting to um, the council the final recommendations and the implementation plan. And we will then go into finalizing um, the uh, executive report that currently we're projecting um, between 30 to 50 pages um, and a community impact uh, report that is um, a smaller piece you know, to be able to um, to share information with the larger um, community and hopefully in a way that's you know um, more understandable. And then by August of this year, we will release the final comprehensive report with all of the um, attachments and documentation. Um, I think that report will be online because it looks like it's going to be pretty uh, voluminous. Um, and I just wanted to say that, Councilwoman, I just again wanted to have an opportunity to thank um, the city staff, you know, our, our deputy um, city manager, Peter Sononi, and um, Veronica Soto, our director of neighborhood and housing services really their entire team. They, they have been um, part of this process from the beginning and we recognize that you know, for this um, to be able to, uh, to go into effect and be implemented and be successful, it really requires um, you know, having uh, the city staff at the table and taking ownership. Uh, and I also want to recognize, of course, the mayor's um, office. Um, Marisa Bono, the um, chief policy um, officer, along with uh, Victoria uh, Gonzalez, um, and any other members of, of the mayor's um, uh, team who have also been, of course, funding, supporting guidance throughout the process. Um, so thank you very much for having us, and we appreciate the feedback um, and the uh, comments and the ideas that were generated today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have, we are, that was our only item. Uh, we kept it short. So thank you all. Have a great day.